Okay, we're resuming now with the question and answer period. Each of our debaters will receive three questions and will alternate. We'll start out with uh, Nadir getting the first question. These are questions that came from the audience. Okay, Nadir, this is for you. If Muhammad is the pattern of conduct, 3321, and the Hadith of uh, Bakari and the Sira document, many cases of Islamic violence by and through Muhammad, please explain why Muslims around the world follow this pattern of conduct. And you have two minutes to respond, please. Well, I think what's happening tonight is you're not able to prove your case from the Islamic sources. You know tonight that, I mean, the type of violence that we see, you can't find that inside the Islamic sources. So I think the person who asked the question is now making a hasty retreat and trying to quote these losers and scumbags who are doing this type of violence because they can't argue their case. He said, no, they're following Muhammad. Well, that's what we're here to do today. We are here to see if Muhammad wasallam, was teaching that. Now, I believe I have already addressed this issue in my last debate with Sam Shimon. And I believe that was an issue which was, the issue was clearly proved in that debate. I quote it, Islam condemns terrorism. Islam condemns the type of violence that you see these people are doing. And I remember, I, I looked at my opponent, Sam, and I said, Chapter four, verse seventy, or, or nine, I'm sorry, chapter four, verse ninety-one. The spot check condemns terrorism, and I said it to him. I blew my face every time I got up here. He did not rebut that. So good. That's what debates are for. We get to the truth of the matter. A two and a half hour debate proved that Islam does condemn terrorism. All right, and I want a little bit of honesty on your part. What are these debates for? Is this just some kind of exercise? No, we're here to prove stuff. So when you watch a two, uh, two and a half hour debate that one, one dummy Muslim is saying the same thing over again, over and over again, now you have to accept that if your opponent cannot refute that argument. As for why these people are doing what they're doing, actually there's terrorism on both sides. You, have, you also, also have to address the Christian terrorists who are falsely interpreting their scriptures that Jews must invade and take over Arab land. So you've got terrorists on both sides. I don't believe either terrorists uh, represent what the scripture is teaching. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. But the Christian terrorists and the Muslim terrorists, Thank you. they're the enemy of the United States of America. Okay, uh, David, you have one minute response time, if you'd like. So here's the story. We see Muslims in Pakistan and Egypt and Iraq horribly persecuting Christian minorities. We see Muslims who will do anything in their power to kill Jews. We see Muslims engaging in terrorism. We see Muslims fighting the unbelievers. And according to Nadir, this has absolutely nothing to do with verses like, fight those who do not believe in Allah. It has nothing at all to do with Muhammad saying, the greatest deed that you can possibly perform is to wage jihad has nothing at all to do with Muhammad saying he's been commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada. Fighting the unbelievers has nothing to do with Muhammad and Allah's crystal clear commands to fight the unbelievers. That's the story. There is the first question for David. What are some evidences that Islam promotes peace? What does jihad mean? What is the best form of jihad? Um, what are some evidences that Islam promotes peace? Well, um, I don't know of any, unless you mean sort of an endgame peace, where mm -hmm. once Islam has conquered all rivals, then uh, then the world will be in peace. I don't think that would even happen because there's so much infighting among Muslims. Um, so I don't know of any evidence that Islam promotes peace. I will say this. No, I, I can think of a situation. The example we have from Muhammad is that when Muslims are totally outnumbered, when Muslims are totally outnumbered, as Muhammad was in Mecca, then you promote peace. And you have peaceful revelations of the Quran revealed during this time. Surah 109. 
to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Wonderful, wonderful, peaceful, tolerant verse. If that had been the end of the Quran, I would have said, what an awesome book. So, you could say Islam promotes peace in a context like the United States of America, provided the United States was not doing anything in Muslim lands at all. In that hypothetical situation, you could say Islam promotes peace in that area because Muslims are commanded to live in peace until their numbers rise to such an extent that they can fight and subjugate all other people. Um, so, as far as what was the best type of jihad, uh, I think the question was what, what was the best type of jihad, um, Muhammad said, Muhammad gives an answer uh, to this question in the Hadith. He says that the best type of jihad is the kind that results in dust and blood and so on and, and on your horse. So, uh, from Muhammad himself, the type of jihad he's referring to is the type of jihad that involves fighting, slaying and getting slain. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there is actually uh, many examples of that, and I, and I gave that tonight, of, you know, one example of peace. Ending 600 years of war between the Zoroastrian Persians and the Roman Christians, 600 years of never-ending war. Surah 9, verse 29, ended the genocide of the Jews at the hands of the Christians and vice versa, and made, really, they were barbarians, made these barbarians, I'm not calling people today barbarians, folks. I'm just talking about the 6th century, okay? Made them live under one law in peace and ended all of this genocide and war between them. That's a very peaceful thing to do. You know? And that's why we say Islam is a religion of peace and why Islam is a religion of truth because it did that. And that argument has went unrefuted tonight. So if you see tonight, they're not able to address my arguments. So everybody's running to Al-Qaeda and losers like the Taliban. Well, I, if the debate was about the ideology of Al-Qaeda and Taliban, then you should have told me that. So what we're seeing here is a systematic retreat from the audience. Thank you. Our next question is for Nadir. Uh, chapter 3, verse 85 of the Quran says, Allah doesn't accept any other religion except Islam. Please explain this. Yeah, absolutely. There is no salvation other than Islam. This is the way everybody understands the Quran. Okay? Now, if you're trying to pull a stunt tonight by trying to show that somehow this verse means you go kill anybody who doesn't accept Islam, well then that's nonsense. Okay, you're not going to be successful in tonight's debate. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, has already addressed this. He said, in Sayyidina Ibn Ishaq, he said, He who holds fast to his religion, anyone, he who holds fast from his religion, will not be seduced from it, whether Jew or Christian. Is that clear for you guys? Is that clear? He who holds fast to his religion will not be seduced from it. And that was a declaration of war against born-again Christianity. Because the Christians didn't believe that. The Christians subjected other religions and, and their own people to blood-curdling torture. So this is how and why Islam spread. And this is a historical fact, not really open for debate. Islam spread because it gave people the right to believe in the religion of their choice, a fundamental right which six century Christianity condemned. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm like totally forgetting what David Wood was mentioning, but anyways, I'll go ahead and let David come up. So, um, there's a question. The Quran says, no religion except Islam is to be accepted. And you can interpret it in two ways. One, that means that Allah, at the end of the day, is not going to accept any other religion <coughs> other than Islam. Or two, you could interpret it to mean that Muslims are not supposed to accept 
any other religion other than Islam. If you, uh, if you are a polytheist, Muslims are not supposed to accept that. Well, how do we know who's right? It's ambiguous. It's an ambiguous verse in this crystal clear revelation. Well, if the Quran is fully explained, then you explain this verse by going to other parts of the Quran, such as Surah 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah until when? Until they pay the jizya and feel themselves subdued. That's in the case of Jews and Christians. That's in the case of Jews and Christians. So I think that would actually be your best response to Surah 385, is to say, aha, we could kind of accept Jews and Christians since they, in theory, believe uh, in Allah. Thank uh, you. As long as they're subjugated. Our next question is for David. Non-Muslims seem to be mistreated in Muslim countries today. How were they treated under Muslim rule in the past? Give evidence of this. Please explain Spanish, Muslim, non-Muslim coexistence in the 800 years of Muslim control of Spain. I don't think I can do all of that in two minutes, but uh, I will give you some idea of how Christians and Jews were to be treated under Islamic rule. And I won't go, in fact, I, I don't even want to go to Spain because the, the Muslim could be free to say, well, you know, that doesn't represent true Islam. So we will go to Muhammad's rightly guided caliph, Umar. How did Umar treat the unbelievers? How did Umar treat the Christians who wanted to accept the clause in the Quran which allowed them, as long as they're subjugated, as long as they feel themselves subdued and they pay the jizya, how would they be treated? Well, they had to sign an agreement. They had to sign an agreement. Here are some of the stipulations of this agreement. The Christians had to sign this. The Christians are forbidden to build churches or monasteries in their cities or nearby areas. They are not allowed to renovate such buildings. They must allow any Muslim to lodge in these buildings for three nights and provide him with food. They must not display any sign of their unbelief, no crosses, or forbid their relatives from converting freely to Islam. Furthermore, they must show reverence to Muslims and give them pride of place at their assemblies. They are not allowed to use a saddle on a beast of burden, nor bear a sword, nor any other weapon. They are not to display a cross or any of their books as they are passing Muslims on their way. There's a long list of things that you're not going to do as a Christian. Notice many of these, many of these things would include basic things you're supposed to do as a Christian. But what if you said, hey, I don't like these rules? Well, now should Christians ever deviate from obeying these rules, Muslims would cease to honor their covenant that had, that had protected them. In that case, Muslims can deal with them as if they have become a people of discord and trouble. And if you want to know what Muslims do to people of discord and trouble, read Surah 5, verse 33. Unfortunately, David Wood has once again demonstrated his lack of knowledge of the Sirah of Prophet Muhammad He keeps saying a long list of, of what Christians are not supposed to do. This guy is thinking that there's only one type of Christian during the life of Muhammad. There are many Christians. There were the Coptics. There were the Ganesses. There were the Nestorians. There were many, many different versions of Christianity. Omar only implemented this against the Christians of Syria. Against the Christians of Syria. Uh, you know that long list which he was quoting for you? It's not found in canonical scripture. It's not a teaching of Islam. But these were their political decision. It was Omar's politi political decision to implement that on only the Christians of Syria, but the other Christians, no. On the Jews, the pagans, the Zoroastrians, no restrictions are placed on that. Now why? I don't know. But the important point here tonight is to understand this was his political decision because these things are not found in religion. And there are the questions for you. This will be your last question. In the United States, there are many Muslim mosques. Do Muslim countries allow Christian churches to profess their beliefs? Uh, in the United States, there are many Muslim mosques. Do Muslim countries allow Christian churches to profess their beliefs?
what does that have to do with the issues which we are debating today? This has nothing to do with that. If you see what's happening, and the Christians are making a hasty retreat away from the evidences which I'm presenting them. You need to debate, the seven, you need to ask me questions about the, about the paper I gave you tonight. The seven reasons why Islam, I'm sorry, Surah 9 verse 29 is the most magnificent verse of the Quran. Now we're talking about, well, what's happening in today's time. You should have told me that was the debate topic. You see the retreat? They're going away from the scripture. Uh, but to answer that question, I would say yes, absolutely. There are, but at the same time, I would also say there are things which are clearly, which go, which you will see persecution happening. But the greatest persecutors are actually the American Christians. Look at the persecution they put the Palestinian people to. They have falsely interpreted their Bible to create a terrorist doctrine to invade the land of Palestine and steal this land away from the Air, from the Palestinian people and to hold them inside these refugee camps, which are basically like concentration camps. And they tell us, well, yeah, God wants that. What about these terrorists? We need to, if we want to talk about religious freedom, we need to confront the Christian terrorists and the Muslim terrorists. Both terrorists are the reason why this September 11th happened, that we had to suffer all this, all this stuff because of these terrorists. So what I want to hear from the Christians is a condemnation of using the Bible to invade Israel and steal Arab land. I want a condemnation from that. But yet these terrorists don't condemn that. They want to talk about the persecution of Christians. So this is just hypocrisy, but it's really not the topic of tonight's debate. We need to talk about the scripture. Islam came to fight for the religious freedoms of people. That was clear from chapter 22, verse 40. If not, churches, synagogues, and mosques, or God's name would have been revealed, would have all been torn down. Chapter 22, verse 40. Let's stick on the topic. Well, think about what Nadir just said. He said Islam came to uh, defend the religious freedoms of the people. And then he asks why anyone would wonder if you have the freedom to build a church in the Muslim world. Islam came pro to promote religious freedom. Why would you ask if I can build a church in the Muslim world? Why can't you, by the way, why can't you build a church in the Muslim world? Well, it goes back to the Pact of Umar. The Christians are forbidden to build churches. This is, this is Umar, one of Muhammad's closest companions and one of the rightly guided caliphs. That's as good as gold in Islam. You can't build churches because he would not allow it. So Nadir says, Islam came to promote religious freedom, and we see the exact opposite from his own sources. And you could go a step further. This is only in certain Muslim lands. In Arabia, Christians weren't supposed to be allowed at all. Muhammad said, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any except Muslim. Thank you. And we have one remaining question for Dr. Woods. And after this question and the response by Nadir, we will then move on to the concluding comments by each of our debaters. Okay, Dr. Woods. The argument about the Quran and fighting, the context and translation can be rooted back to the, to the revelation in Arabic. Have you studied the Arabic language as the words? Oh, sorry, come on the back. As the words cannot be fully translated into English, can the word fight in Arabic come from a different context in the language? Well, I think we're going back to the it only works in Arabic defense. And uh, as, a, as a brief response, I would point out, if this is the religion that is meant for all people in all the world, it makes very little sense to say you can't understand this religion and you can't understand what it commands unless you happen to know classical Arabic, which most Muslims don't even know. Uh, so, no, I haven't. Uh, I, I, I took a class in Arabic, but certainly not enough to, uh, to uh, read the Quran. Uh, but I'll just say, again, if Islam only works, if you can only understand a command like fight those who do not believe in Arabic, then you're in trouble. And by the way, the word fight there is katalu. It is a command to fight. And if you want to know what does this mean, 
Thankfully, the Quran defines it for us in Surah 9, verse 111. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. This version of fighting that you find in Surah 9 involves slaying people until you get killed. And if that's not enough, we have Muhammad's uh, actions that are based on these commands in which he went out and fight, and you have the actions of the early Muslim community who certainly understood what this verse meant. When they heard it, when they uh, understood what it meant, they went out and fought, and it would be very odd to, for a Muslim to say, well, when it says fight, it actually means have peaceful discussions. Because you'd be telling me Muhammad and all of his followers didn't get that message. fighting passages, as we have seen tonight, are one of the best passages of the Quran. Read chapter 4, verse 75. You don't need Arabic to understand what chapter 4, verse 75 says. And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the way of Allah? For those who are weak, oppressed among men, women, and children, you see them crying. Our Lord, send us someone who will rescue us from this oppressor. What don't you understand in the English about this? I think that's very clear to me. Look how the companions of Muhammad understood this. Omar said, we will fight to secure the safety of the non-believers. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz says, we will wage war on any enemy of the non-believers. That's why fighting, if you look and see that, absolutely, the fighting part, you know, if you understand it within the context of Muhammad and his companions understood it, you'll see they're actually one of the best parts of the Quran. Okay, our concluding portion for this evening, for this debate, will be closing five-minute closing statements by each of our debaters. Uh, Nadir, you may go first. Well, I want to thank David Wood for debating me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to do this. Tonight's debate was a clean sweep. All of the arguments which I have presented tonight went unrefuted. The only thing we heard tonight, Muhammad didn't really mean to do those good things. Nah, he didn't mean to do that. Let's look at those seven unrefuted arguments which we have heard tonight. We didn't even, he didn't even bother to even address most of them. We said, we, we, I argued tonight that there's a false presupposition people use when they open up the Quran. They assume that Christianity is a religion of peace and tolerance, but that's not true. That was not the historical context of the Quran. Argument number two. The Christians of the 6th century were a clear and present danger that if not confronted would unleash a brutal campaign, genocide, torture, and barbarianism until all knees are bent to Christ. Chapter 9 Verse 29 came to meet this challenge and fought so that people can have the right to believe in the religion of their choice, a fundamental right which 6th century Christianity denied. And that is the, that, if you read history, history is unanimous upon this. This is why the Christians allowed the Muslims to enter their land. Listen, you have a small group of Arabs here who are now in charge of a vast amount of Christian land. These, these, if they would have mistreated those Christians, those Christians would have thrown them right back into the Arabian desert where they came from. But they accepted them. And as I quoted for, uh, quoted for you, that when the Muslims entered their land, especially after the Battle of Yarmouk, they began to play music and danced in the streets because of the oppression they saw. Argument number three. The non-believers were bitter enemies um, and continued to commit atrocities against each other. Chapter 9, verse 29 ended 600 years of never-ending war between the pagans and the idolaters. Nothing from David Wood. He accepts all this, but you know, he's just trying to win a debate. He won't come up and say, okay, now you're right about that. Oh, Muhammad didn't really mean to those good things. The Quran says, fight the non-believers. What part of that don't you understand? And he just kept saying that over and over again. Of course, yes. But we're trying to show you the good in that. 
There's a lot of good in that, in fighting the unbelievers. There's a lot of good in that, and I hope you can see them tonight today. There, argument number four. There is a necessity. There is a moral obligation to fight against the non-believers. And I hope that's clear. We, we gave you example of the horrendous genocide which the Christians perpetrated against the Jews. Nothing, nothing ended that genocide. The Jews were finished. And the Jewish Virtual Library clearly said the Jews were finished. However, things were going on in the Arabian desert that which within seven years would change the course of history. And that man is Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and chapter 9, verse 29, this verse he's complaining about. Those were the marching orders that fought and defeated this Nazi version. And I don't want to say that, you know, Christians are like that. I don't want to argue about the Nazi version of this religion. And that's why we say that Islam is a religion of peace. And why we say that Islam is a religion of truth. Because it came to confront and condemn the genocide and the terror of the version of Christianity which we saw during Muhammad's life. Now, I'm not saying you guys are like that, so please don't misrepresent me. Argument number five. Islam teaches to fight the good. Fight for, for those people who are oppressed. Nothing from David Roy. And then we saw how Omar was in Abdul Aziz. Yeah, fight those people who are non-Muslim. Absolutely. And why? Omar said, we will fight to secure their safety. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz said, we will wage war on any enemy of the disbelievers. And that's what they were looking for. And the seventh argument, we didn't even get even to touch this argument. Chapter 9, verse 29, opened up the doors of science for the European world. The Renaissance and scientific revolution in Europe drew upon the contributions of what? Not Islam. I mean, yeah, Islam, but in specific. Surah 9, verse 29. Fight the unbelievers. And to, uh, fight those who are the unbelievers. There's a lot of good in the world that this one verse has done for the world. And I hope you guys can see that. Well, I wanted to quote a couple of passages of the Quran in this conclusion. Uh, I'm reluctant to do so, though, because the Quran seems to be utterly meaningless to Western Muslims. You can quote the clearest verse of the Quran, and, well, you, you don't know what that means. There's no way we can know what that means, and even if it's the clearest verse in the Quran, sorry, as long as we don't like it. But think about what, these, what this is. I'll, I'll, I'll take a risk. Surah 33, verse 36. It is not for a believer, man or woman, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter that they should have any option in their decision. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, he has indeed strayed into plain error. When Allah and Muhammad have given a decision or a command, it is not for the believer to show any resistance. Surah 4, verse 65. But no, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. According to the Quran, you cannot be a Muslim until you accept Muhammad's decisions with full submission. No resistance whatsoever. We open up the Quran. Fight those who believe not in Allah. That is a clear command given to Western Muslims. And what do they say? No. Can't do it. Can't do it. Whatever Allah means, he must not mean fight those who do not believe in Allah. He must mean something that only occurred back then and in that historical situation. Could have said that in his perfectly clear book, but instead he gave this blanket statement to fight those who do not believe. That's what Western Muslims are telling us. So we've seen the Quran. We've seen the Hadith. Nadir quoted Ka'b bin Malik, and Ka'b bin Malik didn't even agree with him. I quoted Ibn Kathir, the greatest Islamic commentator of all time, repeatedly, who agreed with me. So Allah agrees with me. Muhammad agrees with me. Islam's greatest commentator agrees with me. Let me give you one quotation, since Nadir brought up the issue of religious tolerance 
in Islam. And Islam came to make sure you have the freedom of religion that you so desire. Quoted everything else, now I'll quote Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion and the first rightly guided caliph. The man that the early Muslim community said, if anyone's going to lead, it's going to be that man. If anyone's going to lead after Muhammad, it's him. This is how Abu Bakr described Muhammad, what Muhammad did in Arabia. Verily God, may he be exalted, sent Muhammad with his truth to his creation as a bearer of good tidings and as a warner and as one calling others to God with his permission and as a light bringing lamp so that he might warn all who live and so that the saying against the unbelievers might be fulfilled. So God guided with the truth whoever responded to him and the apostle of God with his permission struck whoever turned his back to him until he came to Islam willingly or grudgingly. What's the Quran say? Fight those who do not believe. What does Muhammad say? You fight them until they recite the Shahada. What does Ibn Kathir say? You fight all people of the world until they either pay, uh, convert to Islam, pay the jizya, or you kill them. What does Abu Bakr say? Muhammad went out, brought people to Islam whether they liked it or not, willingly or grudgingly. And the deer looks at all of this and says, this is what God did to promote religious tolerance and harmony. You see how well it worked then with the Pact of Umar. And you see how well it works now. What Nadir is telling us is his God is a total failure. Back then and now. It's not working now. It wasn't working then. And if we take his command seriously, no one could ever follow his religion because we could never know what Allah means. If I can't know what Allah means when he says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, how do I know I can believe him when he says, believe in Muhammad? Maybe when he says, believe in Muhammad, he means something totally different. Maybe when he says, you're supposed to pray, he means something totally different. Maybe when he says any of these things, he means something totally different because the God Nadir is presenting to us does not know how to make his message clear. And millions of people have died 